Welcome to BP Online. We're a church that meets in North Central Calgary with people from all over the world, from all different walks of life, and we're excited you're joining us today. We hope that as you watch online, you're encouraged and challenged in your faith, and most of all, that you encounter Jesus. If you're checking us out for the first time, welcome. You're in the right place at the right time. Whether you're watching us at home or on the go, we hope you'll be impacted by the service today. Thanks for joining us. We will be starting in just a few moments. Well, welcome to BP Church, everyone. So glad that you're here. Why don't you stand up, especially if you're on uh, on uh, the live stream. We want to welcome you. Put your hand to the screen. High five, high five. We're so glad that you're here. We're starting a new series on the Holy Spirit. And he is our helper and our comforter. Amen. And so I really want to say, I'm going to be praying. I'm just going to pray in that way. And, and we're going to sing some songs. We're going, to, we're going to engage in worship just to just say, we love you, Lord. We need your help. <laughs> be with us. Amen. So, Lord, we thank you as we just rejoice with your great victory, dying on the cross, uh, rising, that we may have new life and that you are sending your comforter, your helper, the Holy Spirit to help us, to guide us. So, Lord, I just pray that whatever it is that you want to do in and through us, through our singing, our acts of worship, Lord, hearing the word, that, Lord, that you would forever change us to be salt and light in your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Let's sing together. Heaven and land Heaven and land 
praise becomes your house, your place. Our praise becomes your house, your place. Our praise becomes your house, your place.
love your presence, Jesus. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us, come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us, come rest on us.
when you fill the room You're here and I know you will move it I'm here and I know you will fill me Come now, spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound When you fill the room I'm here and I know you will move it I'm here and I know you will fill me You will fill me up Holy Spirit, come Welcome your presence, Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Sing that out, Holy.
want him to rest on you. Amen. Doesn't that sound wonderful? <laughs> Just as we were singing that song that, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. That that has to be true in our lives. Amen. It's not always, but it has to be. And not just that you're welcome here, but that it's mandatory that you're here in my life. I need you to be here in my life. And if I could just say this, as we were just worshiping and praying, I just felt the sense of there's some of us that have said yes to Jesus. And we said, I'll take it from here. I got it. I'll do it on my own strength. And you're not having a fun time doing it. But he sent us the comforter. He sent us the helper to, to live the life that we can't live, to love in ways that we couldn't, that the guilt and shame that we have that says that, that you've been bought with a price. 
So Lord, I thank you that you sent the comforter. And Lord, for us in this room that need comfort, I pray that they would receive it in Jesus' name. You are welcome in this place, Holy Spirit. Lord, for those that have just been, that have just been trying to do it on their own and they have not cried out for your help, <laughs> that today they would cry out for help and that they would receive it in Jesus' name. Lord, for those that, that have just tried to do it in their own strength, but they need your empowerment of the Holy Spirit to love their neighbor as themselves, to offer forgiveness to those that have hurt them, to make wise choices in the ways that we honor you with our lives. Lord, we need your Spirit. You are welcome in this place. You are welcome in our hearts. Lord, fill us afresh again. Lord, whatever we need, God, I pray that you would provide and we would look to you for it. You are our helper. You are our strength. You are our comforter. You are our rock. You are our everything, Lord. And so, Lord, in the areas of our lives, whether in this room or online, where we have to try to just do it on our own, Lord, today we repent of that. And ask, Lord, that you would lead us and guide us afresh, Father, that you would fill us afresh with your spirit so that we could do the work that you've called us to do, that we could love the lives that you've given us, Lord, because we are living them for you and not in our own strength. So whatever it is that you want to say and do in our hearts and change our lives, change the directory of our lives, Lord, that, that heaven would come down, as it were. And Lord, that you would do in Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to BP Church. We are so glad that you decided to join us. Whether you're online or in the building, welcome. If you are in the building, there is a connecting card in the seat back in front of you. And we ask that you just take a few minutes and fill out as much information as you feel comfortable giving us. And take it to the Take 3 booth out in the foyer. We're going to put a little gift in your hand, answer any of your questions. Tell you that we are so glad that you decided to join us this weekend. Also, if you have come prepared to give, we do have our giving boxes at the back in the foyer and bpchurch.ca slash give online. Thank you, as we are trying to reach 1% of North Calgary. Well, just a couple quick things we want you to be aware of. Now that things are starting to open up a little bit, restrictions are easing, uh, we just wanted you to be aware of our Wednesday night prayer at 7 p.m. It's a great time to pray, uh, to worship, you're a little encouraging, devotional, and just really have a great time in the presence of the Lord. It is fantastic. If you've never been before, we encourage you, go to bpchurch.ca slash prayer and you can register today. Hey ladies, it's Andrea here. I would like to invite you to uh, sign up for Hearts Arise. It is coming June 11th. There is still room for you online and in person. Just go to our website for more information. I so look forward to welcoming you back to church. Just want to give you a quick reminder that BP Church has an app and it's fantastic. It gives you all of our events, um, groups, there's, you can give there. There's a ton of great stuff that we encourage, resources uh, to help you grow. It's all there. We were just made known of the Android store that our app is currently not working there. So we're working to resolve that. So we just wanted to let you know. So if you have it on your phone, Android, and it's not working, don't down or delete it. Uh, we're trying to get that resolved. So just be patient with us. It should be up hopefully this week. This next announcement is for parents. Just want to put on your radar that we're going to be hosting kids camps in the beginning of July. They're fantastic. Um, they're a lot of fun. We've got great things in store. We've got interns this summer that are going to be helping. So we think that it will be a blast for your child. So just we're going to give you more information in the next couple of weeks, but just mark that on your calendar. The beginning of July, we're going to be hosting those camps. And also just a reminder that the first weekend of the month is our Missions Emphasis Weekend, where we do our best to bring reports from the field of the things that the missionaries that you support are doing. And so we have one from Jeff, who's in a random access nation, or sorry, restricted access nation. So he's not able to share all of what he's doing, but he is sharing a little bit about what he's doing. And so here's Jeff. While our mission to make disciples amongst all the nations has not changed. There has been greater clarity about our focus, particularly the least reached, those with little or no access to the gospel, representing 3.1 billion people on our planet, and the most vulnerable, those who live on less than $3 a day, 3 billion. And these two are not distinct groupings, but actually there is significant overlap. We have made two promises that you have already seen uh, regarding what we are committed to doing for the least reached and for the socio-economically vulnerable. I would like to present to you 
an impact statement that says that as we accomplish these two promises, we expect to see the establishment of self-sustaining, multiplying church movements and ministries that reflect the compassionate heart of Christ for their communities, their nation, and the world. In terms of what we have done over this past year in preparation for base camp, there is an increasing integration and alignment between our multiple charities within POC, including Erdo and RAN and Villages of Hope Africa Society. We have also taken a fresh look at our country strategy plans in light of these strategic foci and we have been developing metrics to be able to say we are committed to making disciples planting churches, bringing justice to the vulnerable, and seeing sustainable multiplication in the places of the world that God has called us to be able to make a difference. So if you have made missions commitments or you would like to make a missions commitment uh, to be a blessing to those that we do support, uh, just on the app under missions or on your tithing envelope missions, and it will get to those, to those organizations that are really the hands and feet of Jesus in the places that we could never access. Well, church, those are all the announcements that we have for this weekend. Guess what? It is summertime, and some of us can't fly, so what are we going to do? We're going to pack our car full of stuff, and we're going to road trip it. We're going to just get out of Dodge and have a blast. And some of those road trips are great, and others are just like pretty crazy, but they're a lot of fun. We're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit, especially as it relates to the life of Paul. And Paul went on a road trip to persecute Christians, but God had a detour for him. So this time I'm going to invite Pastor Mark to tell us about Paul's Damascus road trip. Good weekend. It's a good weekend, even though it might be raining a little bit here and there throughout the weekend. It's a good weekend. It cooled off a little bit. You'll sleep well. Okay. Y'all have air conditioning. That's what it is. Yeah. It, you're you're, you're going you're gonna to get a good night's sleep because you're not going to be hot and it, you're going to be refreshed and ready for Monday for another journey, for another thing that God has in store for you in this coming week. We are going to look at Paul's life over the next few weeks and, and how the Lord worked in Paul's life and through Paul's life. Now, Paul was a, a, a zealot, as it were. He was a, a Pharisee of the religious, Jewish religious order, and, and he believed it, that God, of course, God was his God. He believed that he had relationship with God because of the rules and regulations that he followed in his life. He understood that one day there's supposed to be a Messiah coming that would deliver the people of Israel, but did not believe up until he has an encounter with Jesus. He did not believe that Jesus is the one that God was going to send. So Paul is on a journey in life at this point when we catch up to him in Acts chapter 9. He's on a journey in his life to persecute the early church, those believers in Jesus, what they call the people of the way, uh, people that believe that Jesus was the Messiah, predominantly Jewish individuals that believe that Jesus had come as the Messiah and they had accepted him into their life, believing that he was the one that was going to give them relationship with God. So that, that's Paul's mindset is this is not the guy. And because of that, and because of his passion for Judaism, he set out to kill Christians. He set out to literally imprison Christians, to get rid of them from society because he believed they were a threat to Judaism. They were a threat to what God desired for his people, and they were taking people away from what God intended for them. He was passionate about this. Matter of fact, we see the first one of the first martyrs recorded, Stephen. We see Paul being the one that is standing there holding the coats of individuals as they stone Stephen. And as this begins to unfold in the New Testament, you, you begin to get this idea of, man, the church is going to face all kinds of challenges because the Jewish religious authority had a lot of power. They had a lot of authority. They could literally put somebody to death in their society, another Jew, because of that authority. So Paul's passion was to get rid of them. 
You know, a lot of times in our lives, when we don't understand something or we have fear of something else, we begin to get a bias towards that individual or be towards that thing that has taken place. And biases can turn into all kinds of things, fear and, and hatred in our lives. And uh, bias towards somebody else can even lead to racism. And in our society in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a few evidences of this again as to where individuals that had a bias or a fear of or an idea that somebody wasn't living the way that they felt they should be living reacted against them and brought destruction to them. You know, in Kamloops, when you hear about the school out there that they found over 200 children that had passed away and not documented and, and no recollection of why they had passed away, just kind of hidden, it kind of makes you think about why something like that would happen. How somebody could get to that point in their mind that they could do that to innocent children. When you hear the news from Tulsa, Oklahoma, where they uh, talk about the 100th anniversary of when Tulsa uh, had this huge uprising where one side of Tulsa went to the other side of Tulsa and literally burned it down just because they actually felt threatened and were scared of who lived on the other side of Tulsa. It was just totally racism. If you, I, I went to university in the States, and I had to take two, two semesters of American history. That was never in my American history class, what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Last year, our staff, we read a book together, and our, our board and staff all read a book together called uh, Be the Bridge. Uh, and in this book, it actually talked about that. It talked, it was interesting, there was a lady, a Christian lady, she's a pastor in the U.S. that wrote this book, and she talks about racism in the U.S. and racism in Canada. And she refers to how Canada's racism was directed primarily uh, throughout history at the indigenous people, and Americans' racism was primarily directed at the black culture of the black people. When you look at that and you look at Paul's life, Paul was so passionate about what he believed that he was killing people, and he was wrong. It drove his actions. There needed to be something in his life that radically changed the way he perceived humanity to get him going in the right direction. You know, I, I want us just to take a moment and, and you know, Actually, I'll finish the story on Tulsa, Oklahoma. If you haven't looked into Tulsa, Oklahoma and the massacre that took place there, it's well worth looking into. Tulsa, Oklahoma, 100 years ago, I think it's the north side of the city, on the north side of the city, a black community had started to form. And that black community was actually made up of doctors and lawyers and highly educated individuals. And they were actually prospering more than the other part of Oklahoma, the other part of Tulsa. And as they began to prosper, people on the other side of Tulsa, which was the white community, became threatened by them. The Judaism or the Jewish Judaism or Paul and the Jewish religious officials felt threatened by Christianity. And in that threatening mode, they lashed out. You see, racism comes from fear, and it comes from misunderstanding, and it comes from selfishness of somebody wanting to make sure that they either stay in a position, and unfortunately it was the religious organization at that time, wanted to stay in a position of power and not lose that position of power. I'm going to refer to the church in a moment, but... The church today needs to be very careful of our actions in North America because the church has been in a position of power for a long time. And the church needs to be careful of how they treat others that are not like them. We need to have a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit in how to respond. But I want us to take a moment and, and just pray uh, for the indigenous people of Canada and for those that 
as they go through this process, even in Tulsa or around the U.S. right now, as they look at what happened there and, and this anniversary of 100 years has passed, that there would be healing. I've just felt this. I mentioned it last week. I just feel this, that there needs to be this healing, this healing of grief, this healing of mourning uh, in people's lives. So, Father, we, we thank you that you are the one that brings healing. And you are the only one that can bring true transformation in the hearts and lives of individuals. And so, God, today as we look into your scripture, we look at Paul's life where he was going in one direction, ready to kill those not like him. God, show us to make sure that we don't have any root of this in our own lives. And God, we pray for healing in, in the indigenous people of Canada and, Father, uh, for the black community in Canada and the U.S. and those of color and in every community that have felt pushed down or pushed aside because somebody felt threatened by them. Lord, we just pray for a unity like never before in our nation, in North America, because of the transformational power of your spirit working in our lives. And God, I pray the church will be the one that leads the way. In Jesus' name, amen. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus uh, had been there, and, and John says this about Jesus. He says, I baptize with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John, being a very popular individual at that time, now having thousands of people following him, makes sure, and this is a great, there's so many great leadership things throughout this, but this is a great leadership uh, tool and, and reminder for us that when God raises you to a position of prominence or, or blessing or whatever it might be, realize where all your strength comes from and realize who you need to point people to. John says, yes, I baptize with water, but there's one coming after me that's so much more important than me. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, and with fire. In John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said. Jesus gives us a little insight into who Holy Spirit is and what he's going to do in people's lives in that he's going to want, be the one that teaches you of everything that I've taught you. He's going to expand on it for you. He's going to help you to understand all of that. I realize and, and I'm very aware every time I get up to speak, I say whatever the Holy Spirit has laid on my heart. But also at the same time, Holy Spirit is telling you something even more than what I'm saying. I love it every time that, that you know, I'm talking to somebody after a service and they say, Pastor, thank you for saying this. this it meant this to me. And they, they say something. I'm like, awesome. Thank you, Lord. I don't even know I said that. But you heard Holy Spirit saying that. Because that's what Holy Spirit does is he takes his word and he expounds it to us. He takes it even beyond what somebody up here will teach. That's his job. He makes it personable to you so that it then begins to develop and grow within your life. In John chapter 20, Jesus again, speaking to his disciples, he said to them, peace be with you. This is after he's died and rose again. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I love this passage of Scripture because it, it has that word, he breathed on them. It's the same word used in, in the Old Testament. Now it's in, in, in Aramaic, Jesus originally saying it, but uh, it's in the Greek or back in the Hebrew. It's the same reference of the breath of God. That God breathed into humanity in Genesis chapter 2 and 3 where he creates humanity in, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 where he creates Adam and he breathes into him and he comes alive. Jesus breathes into his disciples and they come alive. 
because there was a new life that he had in store for them. He has a new life in store for me and you, and he desires to breathe on us his presence, his spirit. And it only comes, and this only happens when we come into relationship with God through Jesus Christ. When we believe that he's the son of God, that he died on the cross for our sin, to forgive our sin, he removes our sin, making room for his spirit. And when he removes our sin and he breathes on us, his spirit takes up residency in us. Jesus goes on from that point, speaking to his disciples, and he tells his disciples, and we looked at this a couple weeks ago, to wait in Jerusalem until now they are endued with power or they are given power by the Holy Spirit to walk out everything that he wants them to do. So he tells us that, that his Holy Spirit is going to teach us. His Holy Spirit is going to reveal things to us. His Holy Spirit is going to empower us. And his Holy Spirit is the one that's going to help us to accomplish what he has in store for us to do. In John, in Acts chapter 5, it says, For John baptized with fire, John baptized with water, which means forgiveness of sin, which means repentance. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, meaning you will be immersed in the presence of God. So this is an, an encountering moment in people's lives. And we looked at Acts chapter 2 when this takes place a couple of weeks ago. And, and we, we see this power of the Holy Spirit coming and empowering the disciples. From there, the disciples began to go out throughout Jerusalem and the surrounding area and began to tell people about who Jesus is. They don't go until they're filled with his spirit, so they're empowered with his spirit. They don't go, but once they're empowered, it drives them outward to show the world who Jesus is. So as they're going, now all of a sudden, as I mentioned, the, Judy, the Judaism or, or the Jewish religious order at the time, they get frustrated, they get mad, they get scared, they're losing control. They're, all of a sudden, they react to what's happening. And Paul becomes one of their young leaders that rises to the forefront with authority to persecute the church. Paul's on the road to Damascus, and as he's going to Damascus, he has letters in hand to arrest any Christian that he finds and throw them in prison for the following punishment that could be given out. And as Paul is going to Damascus, all of a sudden, this bright light comes right in front of him. And from this light, a voice begins to speak. In Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 6, and it says, As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul's natural response was, okay, I know this is supernatural. I know this is not something I'm dreaming, this is God or somebody of a deity speaking to me. And he says, who are you, Lord? Understanding there is a deity speaking to him. Saul asked, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Jesus responds. He replied, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. You can imagine this encounter. In your own life, in my life, I'm sure we've had some moments, if you're a believer in Jesus and have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, I'm sure there's been some moments in your, in your life where God has kind of stopped you in your tracks. In going through even your daily life and maybe checked your spirit as the way you were talking to somebody or, or a feeling you were having towards somebody and corrected you. Or, or maybe it was just a, I need you to go do this moment where God spoke to you and, and gave you direction to move in your life in a certain way. Or maybe he just spoke and said, you need to forgive that person or you need to ask for forgiveness. But in this moment, Paul has this encounter, and Jesus speaks to him, and he says, now this is what I need you to do. But there's something here you need to catch, too, is he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus whom you persecute. 
Now, he wasn't persecuting Jesus himself. He was persecuting the church. So this brings up something I I believe is very important for Christians, believers to understand and to get a hold of. The church is meant to be Jesus on earth. We got that. And if the church is meant to be Jesus on earth, be careful how you speak about and treat the church. I'm not talking the building. I'm talking the body of Christ. Be very careful how you speak about another believer. Be very careful because you're speaking about the body of Christ. Now, I know the church is imperfect because it is the body of Christ, but we're human. But be careful where you go with that. Now, we did look at Peter for the last couple months and and how Peter gave correction and how Peter told us to be careful about false teachers and all of that. And we have to be aware of that and we have to point that out. But be very careful how you talk about the body of Christ. I hate it when somebody says the church is this, 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 and this. I've actually stopped people in public meetings from saying that here because You have to understand who the church is. It's the body of Christ. And when Jesus speaks to him and says, you're persecuting me. Saul got up from the ground. And and, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hands to into Damascus for three days. He was blind and did not eat or drink anything. For three days he was blind and he, he just, he couldn't see. I, I, I believe Paul's inward struggle became his outward reality. I believe that because he was blind on the inside as to who Jesus was and who the church was, and his inward struggle became his reality physically. His spiritual battle manifested itself. And Jesus took three days I love three days. Jesus was in the grave for three days. Three days in the Jewish tradition was a, was a completion number of death in, 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 when it comes to somebody dying. If they had been dead for three days, they were dead. Jesus was in the ground for three days, then he came back to life. Paul was dead for three days. The person that he was and that he was intending to be, and all the things that he could do was now stripped away from him for three days that he had to be reliant on others. And in this moment, in this time, I believe, and we can see here, that God began to speak to him. Because God speaks to Ananias, an individual, a, a person that had understood who Jesus is and come into relationship with him. Obviously, another apostle or another disciple had come through Damascus and shared the good news about Jesus and who he is. And, and, and Ananias had come into relationship with God. And in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord had called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. I, I, I like this because he knew God's voice. We got we to be able to discern what voices are speaking to us. And we got to be able to understand that if we're going to be used by God. Knowing God's voice, it, it brings opportunity into our life. And the Lord told him, Go to the house uh, of Judas on Straight Street. I love the uh, description here that he gets in this vision because it's very clear. God is clear, He can be very precise as to what he wants you to do in your life. He can be very specific as to where he wants you to go. Sometimes it's get up and start going, and as you're on the journey walking in obedience, he reveals a bigger picture, but he can be very specific as to what he wants us to do. Then he says, for a man uh, from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So Ananias knows who Paul is because God has described him to him. The man, Paul, or Saul, from Tarsus, I know who this man is. He's the one killing my friends. Now, if you were 
Ananias and I were Ananias, I'm sure we would have some doubt as to, God, do you really want me to do this? Because that's really what Ananias says is he responds with, but I know he has come here to kill people like me. But God speaks to him again. And Ananias knows God's voice. And there's an opportunity now to bring change to somebody else. You see, knowing God's voice opens up things. But then knowing God's voice actually gives us a responsibility to respond to his voice and to bring the change that he's asking us to bring. In verse 13, Ananias responds to the Lord and he says, Lord, Ananias answers, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. I know what he's been up to. His reputation precedes him. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. I've told you once. Now I'm telling you again. Just do what I ask you to do. Ever been in that place with God? Where you're wrestling back and forth with something that he's laid on your heart. You're like, yeah, I know, God, that's you. You're telling me to do this. But. But. I don't feel like it. Or it's inconvenient for me. Or it'll make me look bad. Or it'll put me in a bad light. Or I'm scared. Or whatever the excuse might be. Ananias had them all. But God looked at him again and spoke to him clearly again. And this is a thing about knowing God's voice. If you know God's voice and he speaks to you, he probably will remind you another time. It's what I've found in my life. But sooner or later, if we're not obedient, he'll stop speaking. Sooner or later, we'll we'll stop hearing that direction because he knows we're not someone he can count on. So if you want to continue to walk in that hearing of God's voice, be obedient. Just be obedient. Take steps of faith. See what it is that he wants to do through our lives. See, knowing God's voice will challenge your natural thinking. It will challenge you to to go beyond, well, no, that guy's dangerous. I'm not going there. When God is saying, I've got a purpose for that guy. You see, God's response to Ananias, well, we'll look at it in a second, is I've got a purpose for him, and I need you to go unlock that purpose. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 tells us, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, each person I believe on earth has, is God's handiwork. Each one of us, every person, those that are believers in Jesus and those that are not. And he's prepared works for them to do in advance. He has something to do for the person that you know that doesn't love him and that persecutes others and is the most detestable person that you have a relationship with. God has got plans already prepared for that person to step into. Think about it. So what's going to unlock that person's life to step into those things. If you're in close proximity, you might be the answer. You see, God sees what we can't see. You guys, you've heard this before probably, that God looks at us different than we look at ourselves. God sees you through the cross and the potential of his Holy Spirit residing in you. See, he sees you saved. He he saw Paul saved. He saw Saul saved. He saw him filled with his spirit and he saw the potential that rests on his life. God sees you saved. He sees you filled with his spirit and his plans for your life are seen through that reality. That's the potential that we all hold. Saved Fill with the Spirit of God. And that's the plans he has in store for us. That's why sometimes when we sense God leading us to do something, we're scared. Because we're living in the reality of saved, but maybe not filled. We 
we're saved. And the Holy Spirit is residing in us. But maybe we've come to a point where we're not overflowing. And our confidence is still in our own nature, our own ability, not in the Spirit of God flowing through us. But God sees you different. God sees you baptized in his spirit and overflowing because that's your potential and that's my potential. Ananias in verse 17, Ananias went to the house and entered in and placing his hands on Saul said, brother Saul, eh, brother Saul, he already sees Saul differently because God has told him he's different. He sees Saul differently. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. He sent me that you can get your sight back and be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus, when he's speaking to Ananias, he says, Ananias, you need to go because I got a purpose for his life because his life is going to reach the Gentiles. I've already planned that he's going to reach the Gentiles and the Jewish people, but he's going to go to the Gentiles. Now, God does say in there to Ananias that I've already planned that he's going to reach the Gentiles and he's going to know what it is to suffer for me. Now, maybe it was the fact that Paul was going to suffer that made Ananias want to go. Because, An because Paul had made so many suffer. But Ananias gets up and he goes. I was talking to Josh. I don't know if Josh is still in the room. Josh was playing bass tonight and playing bass this weekend. And uh, he was just telling me before, he said, hey, Pastor, i got to tell you, uh, this last week I was uh, praying for a guy, and, and this guy called me, and he's been suffering really bad, and he, he has a, uh, a blood clot and a vein going to his brain. And it was causing a lot of problems in his life, balance and different things, and uh, difficulty in, in just living life. And he said, as soon as he called me, I, I just felt the Holy Spirit say to me, you got to go to his house and pray for him. He said, so I went to his house, and we opened his garage door, and he came out to his garage, and we sat in his garage, because I couldn't go in his house. And we prayed. And he said he didn't care that all the neighbors were out around, and they could hear us, but we prayed. And God healed him. He got up, and no longer was he dizzy. And days out, he, he marked improvement in his life. Now, Josh could have simply on the phone said, man, I'm praying for you, and left it at that. But Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, you go, and you put your hands on him, and I'm going to work through you to do something miraculous in that guy's life. And even though it was inconvenient, almost illegal, Almost. He was in the garage, so he's all right. The guy couldn't come out any further than that. God used him to see that guy receive a healing. Ananias gets up, goes, a probably fear of his own life, but trusting God and trusting what God has said to him, believing in the power of God, gets there, says, Paul, I'm going to pray for you. You're going to get your sight back. He speaks faith. I love it. He speaks faith before he even prays. And then he says, and you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You're going to receive what you need to do what God is calling you to do. And immediately something like scales fall from the eyes, from Saul's eyes. And he could see again. He got up and was baptized. Now the word here, baptized, actually is uh, John's baptism, which is repentance or into repentance and, and water baptism. It's not actually a Holy Spirit baptism that we see in Acts chapter 2. This is water baptism. We do see Paul later in Acts chapter 19 when he comes to Ephesus say to them, have you 
receive the Holy Spirit since you believe. And they say, Holy Spirit, we don't even know who Holy Spirit is. What are you talking about? And he says, well, what baptism did you have when you believed? And they said, well, we were baptized into John's baptism. And, and he said, that's good. That's a baptism of repentance. But God wants to baptize you in his spirit. And he prays for them, lays his hands on them, and they, they speak in tongues and prophesy. There is a difference there in the two baptisms. We're going to explore that a little bit more over the next couple of weeks. Oh, yeah, by the way, next weekend... Uh, Tim Almer, my father-in-law, my wife's father, uh, is going to be here speaking. I uh, decided to get him to come, and we asked, I asked him a few months ago, and he said, as long as I don't have to preach into a camera, I'll come. He said, as long as there's people in the room. I'm like, okay, if there's people in the room, we'll make it happen. So as soon as people were allowed back in the room, we, uh, we, we, we confirmed that. But I wanted to, Tim to come because... Uh, I know that the Holy Spirit uses him in a, in a few specific ways. He's got a very prophetic ministry that where he, he's got a gift of prophecy where he speaks life into people and encouragement into people. But he's also, God has used him and Lorraine in the school that they've set up, their school of ministry, to see people baptized in the Holy Spirit. A lot. And so if you've never experienced this gift of the Holy Spirit, in your life. I encourage you to be here. Now, if you're watching online, I'm sure the Holy Spirit can fill you in your room at home too. But I encourage you, if you can, and maybe it'll be the first time back to church for you, because next weekend I expect to have more room, which is also a good thing. The restrictions will be loosened a little bit. I encourage you to be in the room and see what Holy Spirit might do in your life. So I encourage you next weekend, if, if this is your first time back, make it, make it your first time back, but sign up early because I anticipate, well, we have 33% or 30% probably starting, starting Friday. So that'll give us 150 adults in the room, which is good. Not good. Better. Bold steps bring eternal results. As Ananias steps out in faith and is obedient to what God is calling him to do, Paul's life is drastically changed. The scales fall off his eyes. The blindness leaves. The, the, the spiritual blindness that he had that became his physical blindness now is removed from his life, and he has clarity of sight. And he has clarity of direction in his life. Because it says from there, he gets up and just starts preaching. And he starts telling people about who Jesus is. And he's transformed. He's been going in one direction, and now he's going in a completely different direction. You see, an encounter with God is meant to transform our lives. We hear the voice of God speaking into our lives saying, Mark, I've got something for you. I want to have relationship with you. And it's that Damascus Road experience that, that Paul has where Jesus speaks to him. And he knows that he has to either acknowledge God and Jesus for who he is or reject him. And when we have that moment in our life, it's an eternal moment because we have to either acknowledge what God is, has in store and how to get to God or we reject and we push God away. See, spiritual sight brings a physical direction for us. When, when, when Paul's scales fall off his eyes, he's got spiritual sight now like he's never had before. He's had religion, and he's had duty, and, and he's had family tradition, but he's never had direction that was a true direction from God. And now he's got direction. And Paul spends the rest of his life literally pouring out his life to accomplish that direction. Paul, we, we get a lot of teaching from Paul through the New Testament. And over and over again, Paul talks about not living his life by himself, but living his life through the direction of the Holy Spirit. 
not living his life on his own, but that he's crucified himself so he can identify with Jesus, so, meaning that he's laid aside every desire of his own and has just picked up the purposes and plans that God has for his life. There's a radical transformation in Paul's life. In your life and in my life, it brings the question, what directional changes have taken place since you encountered Jesus? Since you've encountered Jesus, since I've encountered Jesus, what directional changes have taken place in our lives? And if there's not been a directional change, why not? Were you perfect before you met Jesus? No, you weren't. Neither was I. What directional changes has been God been trying to make in our lives that we've rejected? What directional changes, whether it be in actions or in deeds or in thinking, have we resisted when Holy Spirit is speaking to us? In Galatians 5, Paul says this. He says, those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, since we've come alive by the Spirit of God living in us, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us keep in step with what Holy Spirit is leading us to do. Where Holy Spirit is leading us to go. See, we need to know God's voice and understand when he's speaking to us and see people as God sees them, see them through the cross and through the potential of the Holy Spirit working in their lives. The next time you look at somebody and go, oh man, I can't stand that person, which will be sometime this week. For most of us, if you're getting out of your house, there's somebody out there you know that just gets on your last nerve. And when you look at them, Look at them through the cross and the potential of the Holy Spirit in their life. See what it is that God has in already in store for them. That maybe you're the one that's going to help unlock it. Get spiritual insight and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not in your own authority, not in your own ability, but walk in the power of of the Holy Spirit. There is no one you need in your life more than the Holy Spirit. That's why, that's why Jesus told his disciples, wait in Jerusalem and wait. We looked at last week and just kind of put an acronym to that. There was, you know, worship and, and be attentive to God's voice speaking into our lives and, and intercede, get in that place of prayer where we're listening and seeing things through the Spirit and then talk. Then speak forth what God is speaking into your life. Be that individual that the Holy Spirit can use this week to really show somebody who Jesus is and unlock in their life what God has in store for them. So Holy Spirit, we just thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that Jesus said that he was going to send someone to work on our behalf, someone that was going to teach us, someone that was going to reveal to us, and somebody that was going to empower us to live the life he had in store for us. So Holy Spirit, very Spirit of God, we need you in our life. We need your presence. We need your power. We need your transforming voice. Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak spirit to spirit right now. Even in our own lives, Father, if there's things that haven't changed since we've invited you in because we're not listening, Holy Spirit, convict us. God, if there's things that we just haven't even heard yet. Give us ears to hear now <coughs> what you're saying to us. And Father, 
I just pray in Jesus' name that you would fill us all fresh with your spirit. That, God, we wouldn't be operating out of this, the idea of knowing you through Jesus, which we're so thankful for. We wouldn't be operating out of the fact that our sins have been forgiven, which we're so thankful for. But, God, we'll be operating out of the moment by moment in filling of your spirit where daily we are inviting your spirit to overflow in our lives to change us but then to use us to be a change agent in this world God where we could speak up against things that we know are not of you and we truly could bring healing into people's lives emotionally, physically, and spiritually. So Holy Spirit, speak spirit to spirit right now. For those watching online, for us in the room, what is it, Holy Spirit, you want us to take from Paul's life, from Paul's conversion, that we need to apply into our life so that we can be used by you? As Pastor Mark sings this song, just listen to Holy Spirit as he speaks to you. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving. doesn't have relationship with you, that you're not active in their life because they haven't accepted who Jesus is, God, I just pray right now that you will reveal truth. Holy Spirit, you will do what you do. Bring conviction where it's needed. Bring reassurance of the Father's love and grace and forgiveness available to us. With your heads bowed, just listening to what Holy Spirit might be saying to you. If you're here today and you don't have that relationship with God that God intends you to have through Jesus Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to simply pray a prayer with me that acknowledges Jesus for who he is, asks him to forgive you of your sin, and invite Holy Spirit into your life. Whether you're in the room or online, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me in just a moment. But just before I do, I'm just going to ask you, if, if you're here or online, to identify that, yes, this is something I want for my life. So on my right and your left, I'm going to look across the room. If that's you, all I want you to do is look up at me and say, yeah, that's me. I need Jesus in my life. And in the middle, if that's you, just look up at me and say, yeah, that's me. And my left and your right, if that's you. 
Just look up and say, yeah, that's me. And online, if that's you, just push that button that says, yes, I want to receive Jesus. And it kind of gives us a little wave hand to let us know that that you are saying yes to Jesus. For those in the room and those online, simply pray this prayer. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me my sin and fill me with your Holy Spirit. That I could live the life that you really have created me for. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing this as we close. others through the cross and through the potential of you in their life and help us to be obedient and attentive to your voice as you speak to us God that we would cross the room or drive across the city or whatever it might be to see your will fulfilled in Jesus name amen Our ministry team is going to be here at the front. If we can pray with you about anything, we would love to do that. Uh, God bless you. Have a great rest of your weekend and week to come. Have a great week. Thanks for watching. If you'd like more information about our ministry, visit bpchurch.ca. Have a great week and live the ultimate life.